the DF-21 Delta is a pernicious weapon. It is designed to kill American aircraft carriers. Chinese strategists have been unabashed about calling it a carrier killer. You're coming in at something like Mach 25. So even if there's nothing that explodes, if you hit that ship, you're going to do a lot of damage. I'm Peter Navarro, and welcome to Episode 2 in our Will There Be War with China detective story. In our first episode, we learned that China's rapid military buildup certainly has the very good and peaceful intentions of protecting the Chinese homeland and the global trading routes China needs to prosper. For 100 plus years, China was beaten up by outside powers. The Japanese and the Americans and the European great powers did terrible things to them. So the historical lesson that the Chinese have learned is never will China be weak because this is what invited foreign aggression. However, many of our expert witnesses also raise the possibility that a hegemonic and revisionist China may be seeking to drive the U.S. military out of Asia. The immediate goal in China is hegemony. They want to reclaim territories that they lost. They, they would, would like, like to get, get the United States out of Western Asia. Of course, it's one thing to have such bad intentions. However, without the requisite military capabilities to back them up, China is likely to be nothing more than the proverbial paper tiger. So in this episode, our experts will drill further down into China's rapidly growing and increasingly deadly weapons arsenal, starting with what many of our experts consider to be the tip of the Chinese spear, its growing inventory of missiles. A large part of China's military preparations has been the proliferation of missiles, lots of them. The Chinese today have the largest range of nuclear-capable missiles of any country in the world. And what I mean by that is they could go from very short range to intercontinental. These include the DF-31 and DF-31A road mobile ICBMs, a new DF-41, even longer range ICBM. Clearly Japan and other U.S. bases in the region fall within range uh, of a lot of these missiles. So if you're in Taiwan or if you're in Japan or even if you're in Vietnam, you face the prospects of, of Chinese missiles uh, that can that can hit you because they're within range every day. So every time you're sitting down and negotiating with the Chinese, you, you have a, a gun to your head. The key thing that ballistic missiles and land attack cruise missiles bring to the table really is suppressing air defenses. Because once you can suppress air defenses, then you can bring in conventional uh, aircraft, conventional fighter bombers. They have over 800 missiles that, that could hit Taiwan just with one salvo. That would be more than enough to suppress uh, Taiwan's air defenses and uh, keep their air force essentially buttoned up and not able to fly. They may not be able to kill all the airplanes, but it would so mess up their runways that they wouldn't be able to fly, which would give the Chinese air force the ability to come in then and comfortably drop lots of bombs and take things out. One of the lessons the Chinese have taken away from the wars of the past 20 years, uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, the conflict in the Balkans, uh, Afghanistan is, Air superiority is essential to uh, winning modern wars. You may not win with it, but you will certainly lose without it. And I think American analysts have come to recognize that the United States may have a hard time maintaining air superiority in that part of the world because of China's ability to deny us access and use of critical forward bases. But it's not just the island of Taiwan and American military forward bases in countries like South Korea and Japan that are at increasing risk from Chinese missile salvos. China's elite second artillery corps has also developed two particularly deadly and revolutionary kinds of missiles, a hypersonic glide vehicle and an anti-ship ballistic missile that, according to the Chinese themselves, have only one target. American aircraft carrier strike groups. In late 2013, a, a development I think of quite enormous consequences was the confirmed test of a hypersonic missile 
And what was unique about this test is that it represents a revolution in military affairs, as the Pentagon likes to say, in the ability of China to defeat U.S. missile defenses. This weapon is extremely important because of its immense uh, speed that it re-enters the atmosphere. All of our missile defense capabilities are designed for ballistic missiles and other targets that have a fairly predictable trajectory. Once you have a maneuvering warhead, something that's traveling at up to 10 times the speed of sound, it is, has made our missile defenses uh, relatively ineffective against that threat. Instead of Mach 2, Mach 3, it's uh, entering at the speeds of Mach 10 and, and higher. And that creates a situation where the possibility for some kind of missile interception of these weapons becomes much smaller. The Pentagon is also looking at the possibility that this maneuvering uh, hypersonic glide vehicle could also be a follow-on system to a unique anti-ship ballistic missile called the DF-21D. This is a system that is designed to kill aircraft carriers. Chinese strategists have been unabashed about calling it a carrier killer. One of the things that the Department of Defense has included in several of the last reports in the DOD report to Congress is the anti-ship ballistic missile, which really is intended to go after the American aircraft carrier. Uh, the anti-ship ballistic missile is basically a medium-range ballistic missile that is carried by a mobile truck. And the goal here is allow for the missile to be fired from the truck directly from the Chinese mainland. It has a ballistic trajectory which takes it into space. The missile would go into the exo-atmosphere. Uh, the warhead then would then re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. At extremely high speeds. Something to the order of uh, 10 times the speed of sound. And having enough accuracy uh, to maneuver towards a ship at sea. For example, a carrier and then to be able to maneuver the warhead in pinpoint precise fashion so that it can hit that moving target. The United States does not have this capability. Only China has this capability. If the technology works, it would be the first time that a ballistic missile with a ballistic trajectory would be able to target essentially a carrier or other large moving targets at sea with pinpoint fashion. We haven't developed one largely because we haven't needed one. Nobody else really had aircraft carriers. There are those who, who have contended that because the Soviets failed, the Chinese will inevitably fail. It's a very difficult technical problem, uh, and I'm not convinced that China has accomplished that uh, achievement yet. You have to acquire the target at distance. That gives you general location. Then you've got to get fire control solution pass that to the missile firing batteries, fire the missile, and as it comes out of the atmosphere, and it'll be blind while it's in the atmosphere, while it's burning back through, it has to then reacquire the target when it re-enters and is slow enough to do that, and then get a hit. That's an enormously complex problem. The problem with finding an aircraft carrier is that even at 100,000 tons, it's big C small ship. You have a huge amount, millions of square miles, and a ship that even at three football fields, is a tiny, tiny spot. We have no idea whether the Chinese satellites and other detection assets can actually vector those things in against moving ships at sea. There's a lot of unknowns there. According to the DOD reports on China, the ASBM warheads have their own radars. So at some point, you turn on the radar as you're coming in from overhead, and you start looking for, again, that combination of big flat platform and probably something that's moving at a good speed, maybe something that's emitting certain signals, and you home in on that. The Chinese have the, the basic requisite capabilities, whether it's the satellite reconnaissance, the shore-based over-the-horizon radars, uh, the airborne assets, both manned and unmanned, that can help to keep track of a moving target at sea and then to guide the warhead uh, to its final destination. The DF-21 Delta is a pernicious weapon. It is designed to kill American aircraft carriers, but without using a nuclear weapon. And that constrains the United States because we are less able to deter attacks from this conventional weapon with our nuclear forces. And China will be more tempted to use this weapon against our forces 
because it has less of a fear of American retaliation. This is how wars start. This is how miscalculations take place that lead to larger wars. There are a few naval weapon systems that are as uh, adjustable, if you will, or as dangerous as maritime mines. China maintains perhaps the world's largest force of naval mines. These are not your sort of very simple World War I era mines. These are very, very sophisticated mines. The smartness of the mine is based in the fuse. And fuses are very sophisticated now and still fairly cheap. They can uh, look for a specific type of ship by revolution of propellers. You can actually go for a specific ship if you have a sound signature for that ship. Then they'll double check it with the magnetic signature they should be getting, displacement of water, et cetera. So much lower probability of mistakes. You have mines that can be fired from the ocean bottom like torpedoes when a ship passes over it. The sensors of the torpedoes are designed specifically to listen in on specific frequencies emitted by specific ships. So if a commercial ship passes above this mine and the frequency doesn't match, it won't fire. But if an enemy vessel passes over that torpedo and the frequency matches, that's when the torpedo launches. China apparently has access to all this sort of technology. None of it's really new or revolutionary. Uh, what's more the point is the fact that no Navy in the world has really very significant mine sweeping or mine hunting capability. Mine sweeping is a very difficult operation. It's very labor and time intensive. Our mine sweeping capability or mine hunting capability is pitiful. And we know from history just how hard it is to clear sea mines. For example, in the Gulf War in 1991, Saddam Hussein's military forces sowed more than 1,300 mines in the northern Arabian Gulf virtually under the noses of the U.S. Navy. The United States and its coalition partners spent an enormous amount of time trying to get rid of the sea mines in an entirely peacetime conditions where the seas were, con were not contested, the air was not contested, and it still took uh, some incredible amount of time to sweep, say, per square kilometer uh, in the Gulf. Despite these mine sweeping efforts, a mere two Italian-made mines costing less than $50,000 scored a mission kill on the billion-dollar USS Princeton Aegis cruiser, sending the crippled ship out of theater with a cracked hull for massive repairs. And so you could imagine what kind of a challenge China would be able to pose if they were able to cede those mines and then essentially create this anti-access bubble over those bodies of water where the seas and the air would be contested. Those mines could deny uh, access to the United States uh, and, our, and allied navies to a very significant degree and could help to blockade targets like Taiwan. In a Taiwan scenario, China would lay mines uh, to shut off, to close out the, the main Taiwan ports. The reality is that Taiwan has only two major ports that really supports the economy. Geelong in the north and Kaohsiung in the south. And if the Chinese can conduct the first move and sow mines uh, in the approaches to those ports, uh, Taiwan would essentially be sealed off. There are no other alternative ports that would be able to provide the sufficient throughput to keep Taiwan going. So when China puts down minefields, it will have essentially its, its fingers around the necks of multiple economies for a long time. That's the kind of challenge, I think, that the Chinese are trying to pose. It doesn't take that many minds, actually, to create that psychological fear uh, of not wanting to get anywhere near those seeded waters. While China's large and diverse arsenal of mines does indeed pose a significant challenge, sea mines are not the only undersea threat facing American aircraft carrier strike groups within the waters of the First and Second Island chains. There is also the increasingly pressing matter of China's rapidly growing fleet of increasingly sophisticated submarines. There are two types of uh, submarines that we really have to be concerned with. 
Uh, one is powered by conventional means, that is an electric motor under the surface and a diesel engine on top of the surface. And submarines operate above surface as rarely as possible. And submarines that are nuclear powered. Uh, submarines that are nuclear powered have a great range and speed advantage. Uh, however, submarines that are conventionally powered are generally speaking more quiet than nuclear powered submarines if they're properly maintained. We have current superiority in submarine warfare. Uh, if you read uh, these uh, Pentagon reports uh, closely, they are all saying for the next 20 years, uh, what they have is junk. Their submarines are very loud. While they're building more submarines, they're still fairly noisy. They never had a, uh, no experience of a sea battle. They are pathetic. But they're uh, inventive, imaginative, ingenious, and excellent at copying. And I expect that they will turn out better and better boats in the future. What they have been doing as they modernize their fleet in the last 20 years is focusing on building conventionally powered submarines. Into the 2020s, China may have a fleet approaching 60 or 70 conventional submarines. In fact, it's the fastest growing conventional submarine force in the world. A conventionally powered submarine generally has to surface every four days to recharge its batteries. China's latest conventional submarines use very modern air-independent propulsion, which allows them to stay underwater for weeks at a time without having to surface to recharge their batteries. Conventional submarines are already very quiet and difficult to find. With air-independent propulsion, they become phenomenally more deadly, especially to American aircraft carrier battle groups. And all they need to do is to sit and wait patiently for an oncoming opponent force to come within range of either their uh, wake-homing torpedoes or their long-range anti-ship cruise missiles. Should a Taiwan scenario develop, should Taiwan declare independence, or should the United States Navy try to uh, intercede in a scenario involving Taiwan and the Chinese military, that by deploying several dozen or a couple of dozen conventionally powered submarines, China could control the waters within the first island chain, preventing U.S. battle groups from entering those waters. They see this as a capability that can allow them to defeat the United States, drive it out of Asia. You can, for example, envision a four deployed Chinese conventional submarines deployed at certain locations, given the anticipated axes of advance, for example, of an American carrier strike group. And they would be then able to without being detected, launch their long-range anti-ship cruise missiles in what's called uh, salvo fires. Essentially, a, a, a whole group of missiles launch at the same time to overwhelm the fleet defenses of the carrier strike group and hope that one of those missiles gets through and uh, does lethal damage to either the carrier or one of their major surface combatants in the carrier group. While China's rapidly growing fleet of conventional diesel electric submarines does indeed pose an increasing danger to American aircraft carrier strike groups and the navies of other countries like Japan and Vietnam operating in the region, China's nascent ballistic missile nuclear submarine fleet presents a far more global threat. Let's lesson in now as our experts discuss the implications of China's newly developed set of nuclear submarine capabilities. The U.S. nuclear-powered submarine fleet is far superior to anything the Chinese Navy can put to sea. On the other hand, the numbers within the U.S. nuclear-powered submarine fleet are decreasing. By 2020, we're only going to have 40 or so submarines available Navy-wide, not all of which, of course, will be in the Pacific Fleet. So while a U.S. submarine is going to be uh, far more capable than a Chinese submarine, numbers do count in the final analysis. China, for a long time, had no capacity to strike at the United States with nuclear weapons. It wasn't until the 1980s that they began to deploy a small number of weapons capable of hitting the United States. It may have been a couple dozen. In the last 10 years or so, uh, China is expanding their nuclear force. The Chinese have finally, after many years of trying, have finally developed what appears to be a working ballistic missile submarine, SSBN. An SSBN is a nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine. In the Navy, we call them boomers. That is, nuclear submarines capable of firing nuclear weapons. Uh, they had one crappy old one back in the 1970s that uh, was built in the wake of the Cultural Revolution when it, was a bad, when, when it was thought to be a good idea to 
uh, to, uh, to, to, to kill or to imprison or what have you, anybody with any scientific and technical expertise. Not, not usually a smart thing to do if you want to build, a, if you want to go into naval nuclear propulsion and nuclear weapons, these very highly technical fields. So that, that, that thing never made a deployment and uh, it it's, uh, never will at this point. But they finally have gotten over this hump, it appears, and have developed a working SSBN. We see uh, brand new ballistic missile submarines. In fact, two new classes of ballistic missile submarines are coming online. And remember, the huge advantage of nuclear boats is they don't have to surface or snorkel. And endurance is a huge advantage. The advantage to their new submarine base at Sanya on Hainan Island is that almost as soon as you leave harbor, you, the water goes down to 2,000 feet. So you can submerge very quickly and thus increase your covertness. Chinese strategists believe that even if one nuclear missile can destroy, say, Seattle or Los Angeles, that that would represent unacceptable harm to the other side and therefore would deter the other side from conducting that first nuclear strike in the first place. In October 2013, Chinese state media across all the major platforms boasted about how Chinese submarines with ballistic missiles could launch nuclear warheads against the United States and kill tens of millions of Americans. If we did something comparable in the United States, the Chinese and the rest of the world would be outraged. So why are we not concerned? Why don't we pay any attention to the Chinese threatening to kill Americans? It's a fair question, Gordon Chang asks, alarmist though it may appear to some. But beyond even China's growing nuclear weapons capabilities, there is also the matter of its increasingly sophisticated suite of cyber and space weapons. As our experts now explain, this high-tech arsenal is aimed not just at defensively neutralizing America's vaunted advantages in both informationalized warfare and control of the strategic high ground, China's cyber and space weapons can also be used as devastating offensive weapons as well. We're in a new age of warfare where, unlike the, the past where it's boots on the ground, we're going to have bits in the air. The Chinese have, I believe, second only to the Russians today, an extremely capable offensive cyber program. The Chinese for at least a decade have developed a worldwide program of using both military and civilian intelligence personnel to conduct cyber attacks against both governments and the private sector. China's capabilities affect us in a number of ways, starting even before a confrontation might exist. What they're doing is they're looking for that military edge, both by improving their own weapons and, more importantly, knowing how to beat ours. They have the ability to go into our computer systems, potentially adversely affect logistical support, troop placements, the ability to move weapon systems, supplies, to be able to support forward projection in the Pacific region. And China's alleged hacking could be deadly for U.S. forces on the battlefield. If you mess with that software, the airplane won't fly, the missile will miss its target, and the ship might not get to where it was intended to go. If you then go to the next area, the next phase of a potential combat, you have to worry about whether they can affect the ability to actually uh, man your systems or the ability to take out satellite transmissions so that the forward information that our troops, uh, Navy, uh, Air Force, etc., might need for placement, for targeting, all of those could be at risk. But it's not just military targets that China's cyber soldiers are taking dead aim at through China's doctrine of unrestricted warfare, the People's Liberation Army is also planning to use tools like kinetic cyber attacks to disrupt, disable, or destroy everything from an enemy's banking and finance systems to its civilian infrastructure. Kinetic cyber attacks are those in which you not simply spy on the other nations, but you implant malware which leads the, uh, to destruction of the infrastructure or hardware of the other 
nation. Whether it's critical national infrastructure, our water treatment plants, our hospitals, our electric grid. The first person attacks in cyber gets a great advantage. This isn't fantasy, this isn't paranoia, these capabilities exist today. And they may strike first in cyber and we could be crippled. While China's growing suite of cyber weapons are indeed formidable in and of themselves on the battlefield, China's cyber warriors have arguably done far more damage through their outright theft of the blueprints for many of America's top weapons systems. The American intelligence community has on a number of occasions been surprised uh, by the quality of the systems that the Chinese have been able to field. Part of the reason they've been able to do that is they've been uh, stealing intellectual property uh, from commercial producers but also from military uh, developers and manufacturers in the United States. China's primary means of gaining information about American weapons is espionage. Either uh, classic cloak and dagger or in the last decade China has become the most effective practitioner of cyber espionage. The Aegis Battle Management System uh, was one of the first targets of Chinese uh, industrial espionage and cyber espionage. The Chinese were not only able to steal the Aegis technology, that is the Aegis Battle Management System, which is at the heart of our Navy today, but they've actually incorporated it into their new and modern warships, which are now coming online. The Chinese stole reams and reams of data on our missiles back in the 1990s under the Clinton administration. All of a sudden they had intercontinental ballistic missiles that, that could effectively reach the United States. During the Bush years they stole information on the F-35. Not only did the Chinese steal secrets about this important new advanced fifth generation fighter, but they're actually incorporating those secrets into their own stealth fighters, uh, as was demonstrated recently with the deployment of the new J-20, uh, that's China's new stealth fighter. During the Obama years, they've stolen information on our drones. And they've begun to deploy weapon systems like uh, unmanned aerial vehicles that resemble their American counterparts down to the last screw and bolt because they seem to be based on designs that the Chinese obtained, presumably through uh, cyber penetration. It's not just that they're taking this and duplicating, it's what weaknesses are they finding in those systems that they can actually use to defeat uh, uh, those weapon systems. They may not need to build a V-22 Osprey, but when they face one, they sure may know well, how to beat it. It's interesting to see how the targeting has changed because uh, DOD uh, suffered significant losses, we can tell. They made a move to harden their networks, make them harder targets, and so the Chinese then switched to the prime contractors, the big defense contractors. DOD then went and worked with the contractors, got them to harden their networks, and the Chinese switched to the subcontractors. And now DOD's working with the subcontractors. Um, it looks like the Chinese are switching to some of our foreign partners. So they're determined, they're inventive, and every place we close up a hole, they find a new one. We don't take cybersecurity seriously, and we don't take defense secrets seriously. And really interestingly, the president, when he was about to have this big summit with the Chinese leader, and they were talking about cybersecurity will be this, this major part of the summit, the president himself actually said, I'm not as concerned about the Chinese stealing our military secrets. Nations do that all the time. He was trying to say he was more concerned about the, the economic espionage, you know, stealing from our companies. But that's, that tells you a, a huge amount of how unserious, not just the current administration is, but, but most American administrations have been about protecting our interests. And the, the number of weapons of the United States that have been compromised by Chinese cyber espionage is too long to even contemplate. It is, it is very frightening. It shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who's been paying attention to these news over the last five, six years, really. Um, everything under the sun has been taken by the Chinese, not just from military contractors or government agencies, but private companies that are uh, manufacturing commercial technologies. And now we're seeing uh, sort of the results of that. It's striking to see that full list because you Well, wonder. that's what I was wondering. I mean, we do hear about this a lot, but when you see this list of all these weapon systems, that's a little surprising, isn't it? Absolutely, and it makes you wonder if there's anything left that they don't yet have because it's a pretty comprehensive list of every cutting-edge weapon system that we've built over the last decade or so. So anything is fair game to steal.
Many people believe that the next war will be fought in space, and whoever controls space will control the world. To be able to strike something, one has to be able to see it. The farther you are from shore, um, the less capable you are because of the curve of the Earth to be able to communicate through line of sight. So in order to find um, an aircraft carrier, for example, that is farther away, you need to be able to see over the curve of the Earth, the other side of the hill, if you will. And that is best done from space. We're cutting back on our NASA budget and cutting back on our space programs. And to our great detriment, because uh, without the ability to control space, it puts our country at great risk. And while NASA wrapped up its 30-year space shuttle program, China has its eye on the sky as they take steps to put one of their men on the moon. Today, China successfully launched an experimental module, the first step in building its own heavenly palace. In fact, China enjoys four main space launch centers. The oldest is Zhou Chen in the Gobi Desert, about 1,000 miles from Beijing. This is a key military testing site for China's medium to long range missiles. And Zhou Chen also was the launch pad for China's first nuclear armed missile in 1966 and its first manned space mission in 2003. A successful liftoff as China enters a new era in its space program. China's newest and most modern spaceport is on scenic Hainan Island. Located just 19 degrees north of the equator, this low latitude facility will be the launch pad of choice for the larger rockets China will need for its Mars and manned spaceflight missions scheduled for 2020. Just why is this so? Well, the fact that Hainan Island is closer to the equator means that uh, any rocket launching from there can take more advantage of the natural spin of the Earth. So the fact that the American Apollo missions launched from 28 and a half degrees from the, uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida uh, gave us a huge advantage over the Russians who were trying to go to the moon launching up at uh, 51.6 degrees uh, uh, inclination. Still a third space launch facility is that of Xichang in Sichuan province. A key military site, Xichang is known most infamously for China's successful test of an anti-satellite weapon. When China shot down its own aging weather satellite with a kinetic kill vehicle, this created the largest cloud of space debris in world history. Finally, there is Tai Yuan in Sanxi province. From this high altitude launch pad, China is not only sending into space various weather and spy satellites, China's vaunted second artillery corps also has the capability to deliver nuclear-tipped intercontinental ballistic missiles to any city in the world. In 2020 or thereabouts, China will also have its first large space station in low Earth orbit. This, this space station will look like uh, links of sausages. You can take one link off and replace it with another one. Perhaps a laser uh, weapon uh, uh, module, if you will. And that's how China will begin to dominate low Earth orbit against the United States. The Chinese have been very close observers of other people's wars, and in particular of American wars. From the first Gulf War, Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, through operations in the Balkans, to Afghanistan, to the march to Baghdad, one of the key lessons the Chinese have taken away is that modern warfare rests upon the ability to gather, transmit, and exploit information, and space is essential for the ability to gather, transmit, and exploit information. In order to defend America's wide-ranging interests, the United States has to have the ability to project over great distances, over thousands of miles, uh, to dominate regions that are far from our shores. Persian Gulf, the Taiwan Strait, uh, uh, perhaps in the future places in Latin America. In order for the United States to be able to deploy its forces, it has to maintain contact with them. It has to support them with information, intelligence, navigation, inputs, and again, communications. 
the way in which we do that is primarily in low Earth orbit via families of satellites. We're dependent on our satellites for imagery, for uh, telecommunications, uh, for a variety of things that support our uh, warfighters. This is a strength because we're better at it than anybody else. But it's also a weakness because our satellites can be targeted with anti-satellite systems on the ground, in the air, or in outer space, and thereby cut off our command authority from our forces. And this is what China wants to do. And so Chinese military writings emphasize that future wars will be decided by the side that can secure what they term information dominance or information superiority, and that a key aspect of being able to do that is to establish space dominance. And space dominance means two things for the Chinese. The ability to exploit space for one's own purposes and to deny an opponent the ability to exploit space for their purposes at times and places of each side's choosing. The Chinese are developing an array of anti-satellite warfare weapons. They include direct ascent missiles, they include electronic jammers, they include laser weapons, and also they are developing a special small maneuvering satellites uh, which can be used to uh, smash, to grab, and to otherwise destroy satellites in orbits. In the event of a conflict, the Chinese will employ a variety of means, hard kill and soft kill, direct ascent, orbital, etc., to one, go after the other side's space-based capabilities, and to defend their own space-based capabilities. All of those things would be designed to degrade our ability to command and control and to engage in what we call surveillance, intelligence, and reconnaissance operations. Well, the difference between hard kill and soft kill, um, there are a couple of different grades, if you will. So the most obvious example of hard kill is if you fire a anti-satellite uh, warhead vehicle that will directly smash into a satellite. This is basically a kinetic interceptor that uh, flies at extremely high speeds and at the impact uh, destroys its targets. Like what the Chinese did in 2007. So the satellite that got hit was shattered into thousands of pieces. It was the worst debris generating event in space history. And that satellite ain't coming back. So that is the ultimate example of hard kill. This is a weapons system that could change the balance of power uh, with the United States. How has this done so? Uh, back in uh, about five years ago, the Pentagon did an exercise, a simulation of a conflict with China. And in the, it was called Air Sea Battle 2020. And in the opening scenario, China fired off 20 anti-satellite missiles and destroyed 20 of the most important strategic communications, intelligence, and targeting satellites. And within a short period of time, the exercise showed that China was able to defeat the United States in a major conflict. Soft kill is a little fuzzier as a concept, but it includes, at one end of the spectrum, you have things like cyber. Imagine if you could get into the control systems of the satellite and point it away from the sun, or point the cameras away from Earth. That essentially is what you could also term a mission kill. China is working on both lasers and electronic jammers. Uh, these are uh, systems that can dazzle the sensors on satellites. They're ground-based. Uh, the electronic jammers can try to disrupt the signals that are sent from space to ground stations. They have uh, tested, for example, um, small satellites that were able to bump each other. And in some ways that's actually harder because bumping means you have enough control so that you very gently touch something. Smashing something with a hammer is easy. Being able to tap an egg with a hammer, that takes really precise control. This is uh, what the Pentagon calls the counter space capability. And China is making uh, remarkable progress in this area because they know that uh, the U.S. military is extremely vulnerable when it comes to satellites. If the Chinese manage to knock out enough of our satellites and cut our forces off from command authorities in the United States, in Washington or elsewhere, the Chinese could pr very likely terminate a conflict in their favor far more rapidly. An American president would be uh, very reluctant to continue a conflict 
if he had no way of commanding American forces. There would be great pressure on him to sue for peace, which would very likely mean a major strategic defeat for the United States. And so we see a picture emerging in Asia of a rapidly arming China and a clear asymmetric warfare strategy seemingly aimed at denying U.S. military forces free and unfettered access to the waters and skies of the Asia Pacific. The obvious conclusion to draw from this picture is that as the military capabilities of China continue to grow, so too will the potential for conflict. In the next phase of our investigation, we therefore must necessarily examine each of the likely triggers, tripwires, or flashpoints for any such conflict, starting in our next episode of The Wild Card and Wild Child of North Korea. <laughs>